In 2 John, the elder, who is John, briefly explains the relationship between these three. First, we see love and truth. John loves those who know the truth because the truth lives in them, abides in them, is part of who they are. And when two parties know the truth, this is the cool thing, when two parties know the truth, love comes naturally. When we do marriage prep with people, and, and Marie and I have experienced this through our almost 20 years of marriage, when you meet together at the foot of the cross, that means when in your life Jesus is number one, it is a very easy then to meet your spouse wherever they're at. It's very easy to. You see, we, we, we kind of see the marriage relationship as the husband and the wife meeting together at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And it's a pretty amazing thing when you see husbands and wives walking in the truth that comes from God. It causes them to love each other more deeply. And there, in fact, there is a sacrificial, an agape, a giving, a surrendering type of love that comes along with that. It's quite wild. We wonder sometimes, well, how can we love our spouse if our spouse is not a believer? Well, the Bible says, in fact, that the actions that we commit towards our unbelieving spouse can actually cause them to become a believer. That means that if you are married to someone who is not a Christian, who isn't a believer, you don't need to go beat him over the head with the Bible and tell him to get on board or get off the ship. What you can do is you can love them and care for them and minister to them and nurture them. And those actions that speak of love will transform not only your spouse, it will transform your relationship, and in fact, it can actually transform the lineage that comes from you. It's pretty amazing. And it doesn't always happen overnight. It takes time. And that's okay. We've got all the time in the world until we suddenly don't, and so that's okay. So I love this. John loves those who know the truth because the truth lives in them. And when two people know the truth, the love that they have and that they need to have for one another comes naturally. That is how we are able to love people who are different than us. That's how I'm able to love people who don't like Volkswagens. I love Volkswagens. I've had like 15 Volkswagens. Uh, it's probably a problem. We need to talk about it. Maybe there can be a support group for it. But then there's guys that just love Chevys, and I pray for them as well. I don't see eye to eye. I don't see eye to eye. I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I'm not going to get into the details, but I just don't understand. But what I do know is that what supersedes my love for Volkswagens and their love, wrong love of Chevys, um, what supersedes that is the work that Christ accomplished upon the cross, right? And so in that, I can choose to still love somebody who's a bit different than me. So that's point number one, love and truth. Second, we see truth and obedience. God, our heavenly father, commanded us to walk in truth. He commanded us to walk in truth. Not just believe some arbitrary truth that comes across our desk, but to actually walk in the truth. What is the truth? We see the truth unfolding in the scriptures as we pour over it together, as we read it in our downtime. The truth is in the word of God. He is our creator. He loves us. We have a condition that needs to be repaired. It is called sin. How do we have that fixed? It, the price needs to be paid for the debt that we have incurred. We can't pay it. We are bankrupt morally. What do we do? We go to the Lord who has given us a way to see that debt paid. That debt was paid by the sacrifice that was made. That sacrifice was made by Jesus. It's pretty straightforward. Well, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice because you have paid this tremendous as debt for me, I choose to surrender to you, and I choose to walk in your will and walk in your ways. This is great. This means that because of the work of Jesus, we have life in abundance, and we have a choice to walk in the truth. In fact, we are commanded to walk in the truth, and because we are commanded to walk in the truth, we can either obey the commandment, or we can run the other direction from it. So I, I choose, I personally, I choose to obey the truth. Now, my rebellious side wants to question it all the time. My rebellious side wants to run the other way. That's just my nature. It's, it's our flesh nature. 
But I have to choose to put that part of me to death, and I have to choose today to walk in the truth. And when you know the truth, when you know what the truth is, obedience comes naturally. So at the very most basic level, if the truth is God is our creator, Jesus is his son, he has given us the gift of his Holy Spirit for life, okay, I'll choose to believe the truth. If the truth is I have sinned and fallen short of what God's perfect plan is for my life, well, if that's the truth, I want to be better. How do I get better? I can't be better on my own. I've created the condition that I, I am in right now. So how do I move beyond that? Well, way to move beyond that is you reach out a hand and ask for help. And that help comes in the form of what Jesus did on that cross. And in that, because Jesus' ways are the right ways, I want to be obedient to what he's asked me to do. My flesh might not want to. Like, I might want to go and drink and party all weekend long. I might want to go and shoot up with anything that I can find. I might want to go and cheat on my spouse. I might want to go and do A, B, and C. I might want to drive a Chevy. Praise the Lord. Hasn't happened yet. The Lord has saved me. I might want to do these things, but instead I choose to accept the truth of the gospel and I choose to obey I choose to. That means I choose to believe that his ways are better than my ways. I don't like to think like that very often. I'd love to think that my ways are better. I mean, half of us in this room probably think that we're right almost all the time. The truth is you're probably wrong. Nobody likes to admit it, but the reality is is that we have a choice to walk in truth and we have a decision to obey, but when we accept the truth, the obedience comes easily. Finally, we see obedience and love. The, the other commandment that God gave isn't new. We, we touched on it just briefly ago. Love one another. Love God. Love one another. A sign of obedience to God is love for his church. And it's a sign that shows the obedience that we have towards the Lord. Church can be ta- challenging, especially when we know there's people sitting in our pews and people sitting across the aisle from us that are a little bit different than us or maybe think differently than us or maybe walk through life a little bit differently than us. Maybe there's somebody here that's hurt you. Maybe you've hurt somebody and you're too stubborn to admit it. The reality is is that when we see the opportunity to walk in obedience of what God has asked us to do, a sign for that, a proof if you were, is that there will be a love for his church. That means a love for those that aren't just here in this place, but a love for those that occupy many seats on Sunday mornings across our nation. It isn't an us versus them sort of situation that we live in. What it is, is an us versus our own sin nature. And we need to get over that by surrendering to the Lord and allowing his will and his way to be accomplished in our lives. And really, in this process, the thing that gets hurt the most is our pride, right? And I talk about it all the time. It's our pride that gets hurt. And God is so good at just giving us so many opportunities for our pride just to get kicked, right? I don't know about you, but I get opportunities weekly, sometimes daily, uh, to... (laughs) Maria's just gloating over there. Um, uh, Sometimes I get opportunities for my pride to get knocked down a whole bunch of notches. And at the end of the day, you have to realize, well, man, I am just so ridiculous. Anybody ever here ever come to that point where they're just like, man, I'm just ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, it can't just be me. Thank you, Cam. Oh, I thought, I thought I was alone. I was like, oh, this can't be true. We, We get to these points where like, what have I been doing with myself? And it's almost laughable how ridiculous it is. But at the end of the day, what we see come to light is that we've just been running the opposite direction of where God's asked us to go. The, the only thing that gets hurt is our pride. We, maybe we've got to admit we did it wrong. Maybe we have to admit that we actually really messed up our kids. <laughs> wow. Maybe we have to admit that we screwed up our finances because we chased after a whole bunch of things that weren't the Lord's. Maybe we have to admit that We brought ourselves to the brink of destruction. It wasn't God. 
Maybe we have to admit that the state of what we see in our neighborhood is probably a direct reflection of how we have not loved our neighbors. That hurts. It hurts, right? But what hurts in that process? The only thing that gets hurt is our pride. And we're called to actually walk humbly before the Lord. And walking humbly before God means that there naturally has to be an absence of pride. It means we have to say, I don't know what I'm doing. God, I need you. And if anything happens in our lives, maybe when we get far older than we are today, maybe we have opportunity to go out and speak about the truth. Maybe we have opportunity to go and, and call others to walk firmly in, in what God has asked them to do. But, but first, I would say, have we checked ourselves? Because there's nothing that causes more disruption in the life of a community when the church says, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, but the church does the exact opposite. Or the representatives of the church do the exact opposite. We are called to love one another, and we're called to love the Lord, and we're also called to walk in obedience and walk in the truth. So in all of this, I would encourage you to start digging into the word. How do I find out what the truth is? How do I know what is real and what's not real? How do I anchor to the right teaching? Well, I encourage you, read your Bibles. It's actually all there. You're not going to find it on, on scrolling through YouTube Reel after YouTube Reel. And you won't find it after flipping through everybody's opinions and ideas on Instagram. It's not going to happen. Where it is going to happen is when you take time to dedicate your time, not waste it, but dedicate it to reading God's Word. And walking in that instruction. And if you need help to understand or to decipher this, go and find somebody who's been a Christian longer than you. Do it. Go and find somebody because we are actually called to be a community of believers. This is a family of believers and we learn from one another. In our day and age, we love to be independent. And in fact, it's kind of built into our, the DNA of our nation. We want to be independent. We want to forge our own way. We want to do our own thing. But we are actually called and built to be reliant upon community. It's true. So if you're endeavoring to figure out the truth of what's in the Bible, I, I encourage you to go and read the Bible. Then I encourage you also to go and find somebody who's a bit older than you in the faith, who, who lives a life that is a good example, and to ask them questions. What does this mean? What did he mean by this? I don't understand this. Can you shed some light on this for me? I encourage you to do that because you will find a plethora of riches here in your own community that can actually give life to you where you need it most. Beware of false teachers, finally, is what we see things coming to a close here with. John warns that many deceivers have gone out into the world and that Christians should watch themselves, guard themselves. Well, how do you do that? Well, we should be aware of teachers who do not acknowledge Jesus and his human life. We have to guard ourselves against teachings that deviate from the things that Jesus taught. Here's a pro tip. Jesus taught very simply. He taught to farmers. He taught to carpenters. He taught to people in the marketplace. He wasn't sitting around holding giant seminars and going after his doctorate and chasing after the things that qualified him in the eyes of man, what he did is he fully surrendered his life to his heavenly father. Jesus taught a simple message. And all of it is outlined in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's all there. And if you want to know how to walk in the true teachings of what Jesus has said, read those, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they'll get a hold of your heart and they're going to conf cause conflict inside of you because your natural flesh is going to want to do things that are far different than you might be reading in the text. But the text and the words of Jesus, those red letters, will be transformative to your life. And in fact, when you know what the truth is, it will be easier for you to guard your heart against false teaching. John's dealing with, with this Gnosticism in the times, and it's no different than what we deal with today. Everybody knows that everybody in our community loves the idea of spirituality. They love it. But you introduce Jesus into the conversation, and it takes a turn real quick. 
What I encourage you is don't be transformed by the teachings that you hear in the world, but rather have your heart changed by what you read in the scriptures. Because the world is fleeting. It will pass away. Generations change. Societal norms change. Our problems and difficulties, they change. But the, the one thing that is unchanging and true is, is the word of God. And, and we've seen it proven out over thousands of years to be accurate and something that we can anchor to. Be cautious as you are endeavoring to learn the word. Be cautious not to introduce poor teachings about spirituality or the faith into your life. Because when these false teachings begin to take root, they can transform into a heretical doctrine, and you don't want that in your life. If you've accepted some of these things, I encourage you, go back to the Word of God and surrender maybe where your heart and your mind have gone to the Father and trust that He will begin rebuilding and reestablishing the truth in your life as you read His Word. There's a need that John felt to protect his readers from the deception of those who refused to remain in the teaching of Christ, but rather went beyond the truth of the gospel teaching and started clamoring for their own thoughts and ideas to be known. He makes it clear that these types of people are anti-Christ. They don't know God. And he reminds us and the readers that read this passage of our responsibility as Christians to love other Christians. That means that we come alongside one another and we encourage each other, but we also bring admonition where it needs to happen, not for the sake of pushing people away, but for the sake of drawing them back into the truth. We want to encourage one another, as we see in the scriptures, to walk in truth. And and this truth is still consistent today, just as it was 2,000 years ago, and we have to endeavor to walk in that truth even in the world of deception that we often find ourselves in. We have to be careful. So finally, I'll get the worship team to come back up. Much of the difficulty and the confusion that we see outlined in 2 John can be avoided. And it can be avoided through discipleship. What is discipleship? Discipleship happens out of relationship. I don't know about you, but I've got a few people in my life that I love dearly, that we have gone through a lot of life with, and they are the ones that we can celebrate with, and they're also the ones that can tell me to smarten up, and I'll take it. I would say it's probably fair to say most people in this room do not like it when someone comes alongside them and says, hey, you're messing up, change your ways, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. Nobody likes to hear that. How dare you tell me what to do? You can't tell me what to do. You're not my mom. You're not my dad. You're not my pastor. But I would say that we would probably be in far better shape if we accepted correction from the ones who love us dearly. We would be in far better shape if we accepted correction from the ones who loved us dearly than we would accepting the kind words from people who don't care about our souls. Think about that. Think about that. Ask yourself the question, who loves me? You know, your mom and dad love you because they have to. You've got some friends around you that love you because of what you can do for them. Who are the people in your life that love you unconditionally, that have proven that out? And when you're in a challenging place in life, when you're facing these things, go to those ones that have loved you through thick and thin and ask the question, am I really messing this up? What they have to share with you might be so hard to hear. But it's going to come from a place of profound love. They're more concerned about the state of your soul than they are concerned about if you're going to like them at the end of the day. This is tough. This is challenging to wrestle with. Because none of us like to be told how we're doing well or how we're doing poorly. Actually, we would love to be told that we're doing great. We do not like to be told that maybe we're causing a lot of grief to ourselves. 